Art Basel, Miami Beach. This is a salon <coughs> talk, uh, talk about the market called Flip Flop, What Do I Do Now? And I'd like to uh, thank Josh Bear for um, coming up with the concept and speaking today and Kenny Schachter for speaking. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, I'm Josh, that's Kenny. Um, and um, we're gonna do things a little differently, but Kenny Schachter has got the honor of being the only person who's done a talk with me twice. So for some crazy reason, you're back again, Kenny. So welcome. Uh, Kenny is a, uh, a dealer, a collector, a writer, a teacher, kind of an agent provocateur. And I think he's a reformed lawyer, too. So we can hold him. And I think he's also a Republican candidate for president. But he's in the junior varsity debates. Um, good luck, Kenny. Um, my name is Josh Bear. I'm a, art advisor, uh, reform gallerist, and I do a publication called The Bear Facts. Before we start, I'd, I always like to get a sense of who's here, so how many people in this room are artists? Okay, how many people would say they're art collectors? Okay, art dealers? Um, writers, journalists? Got, got lost looking for free drinks? Okay. That's, those, are, those are my people back there. Um, so today we're gonna do this a little bit differently because um, we're gonna do something that's a little bit of role playing. So we're gonna be talking about what sort of happened in the last year or two with some of the new and emerging artists. And instead of being Josh Bear, I'm going to be, I don't know, Joe Schwartz, a, uh, a newbie collector who started collecting about three years ago and I'm gonna be talking to Kenny as if he was like either my advisor or a friend of some of my advisors. So that's sort of our topic. I don't know, Kenny, if you'd like to say something before we get started. Go ahead, I'm ready, I'm ready for you. You're ready for me? <laughs> what, but Kenny, you told me to buy all this stuff. You know, it's like Christian Marillo, was it David Ito, Parker, Rosa or something. It's like, what happened? What am, I supposed, what am I supposed to do now? What's going on? Why did you buy the R? What was your intent to buy these pieces? I mean, really, there's been so much talk and so much press about how a lot of the speculative element has been removed in the game of people playing, buying and selling emerging art. And I mean, it, it really all depends on what the intent of, of people in, in buying this material, also how and where you bought it. So. There's a very, it's a very different phenomenon when you buy things in the primary market or whether you buy them in the secondary market. And I think there was a very brief period over the past couple of years where there was an arbitrage between how much something was worth in the primary market and how much it was worth immediately in the secondary market. So there was a window where you can buy art for $10,000, say, and then immediately resell it, and it caused a lot of friction with the artists, with the dealers, and in turn, the entire market for this sector of art suffered a backlash. Well, I bought it everywhere all the time, from JPEGs, of course, that was the best way to do it. When, you know, I listened, I was buying, you know, reading, you know, Art Rank and, you know, all those websites, and Instagram was a good source for where to get stuff, and wasn't, it, isn't that how you're supposed to do it? It is the digital age, Kenny. I mean, I think part of the problem, if you can say it's a problem, was that people were buying art with their ear before their eyes, and I mean, when you go to an art- I looked at it, but it was on a screen. Quiet for a second. <laughs> art is a very slow-burning, organic process, and it all is I mean, art is this accumulation of information, and it's an organic process, and it takes a lot of time. And when people were coming in for a quick hit to get in and out of art, I mean, it's a misguided enterprise from the get-go if your intent is just to roll over. First of all, if you're buying art from a gallery in the primary sector, you immediately alienate the gallery as soon as you try to turn something around and sell it at auction in a matter of months. So, I mean, it's almost as if there's something morally wrong with buying a piece of art from a dealer and turning around surreptitiously and then immediately popping it into auction or reselling it. I mean, I can understand, it, basically this market was destroyed by a, a very ancient human characteristic called greed. And, you know, the, the intent got confused. There's nothing wrong with a, a Christian Rosa. He's had some 
terrible paintings and some decent paintings, the prices shot up dramatically. There's a whole host of other artists like Israel Lund and various other artists that fall into the genre of what you're talking about. And again, like all of these kids who's I've, it's been written about in various articles in Bloomberg. There was an article how Oscar Murillo's market went up 5,000% in a matter of a few years. And he's one of the rare ones because he was picked up by David Zwerner, so his prices are still holding steady. But nevertheless, I mean, you know, it's not a natural uh, progression when a price spikes up and goes to a couple of two, three hundred thousand dollars for an artist who's barely been making art for a few years. So things had to correct. But at the same time, it's not just the young art, because if you look at the auctions in November in New York, one of the biggest failures was uh, the cover lot, which was an Andy Warhol painting that was bought in uh, two years before, and it was the cover lot of Phillips. And then two years later, it's the cover lot of Christie's, and it's the same kind of a flip involved with all of these young artists, and, it, and, and Christie's took a beating, a loss of $8 million on a guarantee, and it's the same drive that caused someone to buy that painting and sell it two or three times over the course of two years, as with the young stuff. Well, on that one, the, the, the flipper made eight million bucks, but who, who got all my money? You know, I came in, I did all, no one told me not to do this, you know, and where'd all that money, who, obviously I was the dumbest one, so who, who was the smartest one? Who was taking, how'd that happen? Well, how did, I mean, the problem was Christie's and Sotheby's are suffering enormously. I mean, because Christie's is a private company, it's not announced their profit and loss. Talking about the young stuff. And so what's the question? Who ate up all my money? <laughs> well, I mean, again, there are degrees of manipulation, even though, I mean, I'm very, I, I believe in the inherent nature of this market, and I know that there's a lot of manipulation and people endlessly harp about how it's the last unregulated market in the world, but Georgina Adam from the FT, who's in the audience, gave, was in a, was, uh, had a panel, and it was discussed that there were 167 laws that apply to every art transaction. In the United States, there's a uniform commercial code, so every time there's a transaction, there are a load of laws that apply. Who was making money off of these, uh, off of these young artists? It was a whole, it was these collector dealers, dealer dealers, private dealers, Everybody, a lot of people did it, but there was also a lot of manipulation and people were bidding up stuff at auction. If you look at various prices of say Christian Rosa, you could see big prices come up and then the next piece comes up for sale and it's 80% less and you wonder what- That what's was mine. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a group of, of speculators that made money and then the game, it was a game of musical chairs and then the music stopped abruptly. Okay, so what are those two questions? So again, I'm still role playing because I wasn't in this. Thank goodness. But what are those guys, those manipulators, what are they doing now? And B, if you were one of the victims of it, if you say that, what do you do with this stuff now? What, what was the reason that, I mean, some of the people like the art and they kept, and they hang it and they live with it. <laughs> Other and than it, those two guys. <laughs> Seriously, I don't think, as an aside, I don't think people bought it because they liked it. You can't make giant sweeping generalizations about anything in the art market. And the fact is, look, so the biggest beneficiaries are probably the storage companies then. Of course, a lot of it is just squirreled away in the free ports across the world. And if you did have a client who owned a bunch of that, would, what would you be telling them to do? You know, hang, hang on to it. Again, like a lot of these artists, like uh, the poster boy for flip art was Lucian Smith, who found a way to... Uh, insert paint into a fire extinguisher and then he squirted out 300 paintings and his very first painting ever at auction went for $400,000. Some of these rain paintings approach 400,000 and now they're down to 20,000. Uh, there is another artist, Israel Lund, whose prices went up to $200,000 and now they're down to about 10 to $20,000. So if you bought the art and you didn't like the art and you weren't gonna use the art or hang the art, well, there's not much you could do, can you? You can use it for scrap, you can use it for a tent outside your house. You know, either you have it, you like it, or you get rid of it. And you can put it into, you can bring it to Phillips, they'll be happy to try to dispose of it for you, but you're not gonna make much They told me they had 85 of that same artist that I wanted to sell. And I turned down 10 times what I paid for it, because I, I knew it would go higher. You win some, you lose some. You win some, you lose some. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, but then instead of doing that, maybe you can get me a nice Baldessari for like $200,000. Can we do that? Maybe I should move to like some grown-up art. 
I mean, even Roche, if, if you look, if you look in this, I mean, it, the sense of the, what drives the value for young art, I mean, you have to put everything into a historical context again. I mean, there are various artists, as you can buy a Mark Rochon for $10 million, he's under 50 years old, and, or you can buy a Christopher Wool, and they're at the same prices as Leger, Miro, Picasso. So, I mean, people collect this, some of this young art will, in the long run, retain its value and increase in value. Some of it will absolutely be worth no money. So it's a bell's curve of quality with certain artists. Some artists will never recover, others will. And I think the collectors or the people that were playing the game learned the lesson and now they've moved on. Well, can you, can you give me the names of the ones that I should be buying? And uh, no, I, I don't want to pay you for this advice. I just want you to tell me the right names next time a little earlier, but because we're friends, you know, it's, it's like. I'm not so sure I like play, role playing with you. Well, you could switch sides, but th these kinds of things, in fact, I think were going on. That people were having these sort of, I'm sort of moving back in my own character. It may sound silly, but I think that was going on in a lot of minds for new people who are coming to the art world and the art market for the first time and getting persuaded by these things and seeing art as a normal commodity. Well, I mean, I. The art market as a whole, there's been more growth in the past 10 or 15 years than in the previous 100 years in the art market. And having started in the late 80s, and to see, like, being in Miami right now for this fair, I've been to all the fairs, I've participated in many of the fairs, and it's an entirely different animal today than it was 10 years ago. And this kind of, like, you have this whole element of this, like, celebritism, where it's become a glamorous social event in Miami, at the same time, there's art of all stripes available. There are good values and bad values. I think a lot of people got drawn into the market by reading all the big headlines. When, an art, when a painting sells for $100 million or $170 million, people were drawn in, whether it's celebrities that want more uh, credibility or legitimacy in the creative world. People get in for all different reasons. And again, nothing could ever replace connoisseurship, which is a kind of dying breed in the People just don't want to read, they don't want to study, and they don't want to learn these people that come in with a more Goldman Sachsy mentality to try to just simply, I mean, I just, you could make, you could profit very well by speculating in the art market if you put the time in and put the effort in and learn like everybody else. So again, like I said, it takes years and- You did play this game a little bit, didn't you benefit? You weren't- I mean, I've been in, I'm, I collect myself personally, emerging young art up to classic contemporary, I made some, I mean, anyone who's been buying art for decades has made some terrible decisions, and I'm certainly uh, not a, beyond that. I've made plenty of bad decisions and continue to do so on a regular basis. But really, being involved in contemporary art is a reflection of our time, and you, you're, you're, you're buying art among your peers, and you buy things that are personal, you buy things that you think resonate in terms of history and so forth, and you can't always win. So if you bought something for the wrong reason and you don't like to hang it, then you can try to get rid of it or not. But really, there's no, it, it was such, all of this flip-flop kind of stuff, it, it received a lot of attention, but it was really such a tiny segment of the entire art market. Monetarily, it was a very small, I mean, there's more speculation and more flipping going on in the, in the classic contemporary with bigger ticket numbers and more manipulations going on in the auctions. This kind of, um, Christian Roser and Oscar Murillo and all of these artists and Lucien Smith, it's really just a tiny little episode and is now basically behind us. Now, the people who are collectors, if they could raise their hand again for a second. Okay, so you're usually the smartest guy in the room, right? In your business, whether it's real estate, law, banking, you're, when you walk into any transaction, you're in control. But now you come, if you're new to the art world, suddenly you're not. And it's a very difficult spot to be in where you're no longer the smartest guy in the room, you're the dumbest guy in the room. And it's a very unusual thing. It's like, does anybody play poker here? Okay, so there's a rule in poker. If, if you don't know who the mark is in the game, it's you. And that's what was going on for a while in this market. Now, it may still also, you think it's the case in the Fontana market, the Calder market, well, or I mean, not. I don't. In, in, every, in every market, you have, I mean, the art market today, you need, it's like, 
it's, it's, there are people like, for instance, the Mugrabi family are trading Warhols like a full-time job. Their nose is against the screen of the Bloomberg monitor, which is the Warhol market. And anytime you're in a trade with someone of that caliber, they know more than you do. It's an information game. I mean, literally, I've been doing this for 25 years. When I stand in front of a Warhol, I see a different physical picture than they see. They've been doing this for decades. They exclusively, I mean, they've, they've been involved in hundreds and hundreds of Warhol deals, and they see something different. They know the history. They know things, layers of depths of information that I can't, that I'll never know. So it's in a good strategy. If they want to buy it from you, you don't want to sell it. And if they want to sell it, you don't want to buy it? Wouldn't that be a safe strategy there? I would, I would tend to agree with that. We're in they agreement. did sell them Evolution Smith, but that's another story. Um, so, I mean, I think, like, even with, you take an artist like Rudolf Stingel, who's a 60-year-old artist, his auction record is about $5 million, and like anything, there are multiple, there are different series he's done over, over time, and it's, again, it's like, you, there, there are various degrees of knowledge that you have, there are certain series that are, that are more desirable than others, there are certain years that are more, within everything, you really have to know. You can't just go in and say, oh, I think, even a young artist who's very in, in, a very desirable young artist now showing that Kogosian is a young painter from California, Jonas Wood. Within this body, you can't blindly go in and you're not buying a name. Again, you have to buy a piece, a good piece within a good series at, at a reasonable price. So it's all about information. It's all about studying. It's all about knowing, knowing the markets and knowing the work of a particular artist in depth enough to make a reasonable and rational decision. But do you think things have changed? I still hear questions about what's the liquidity of this artist and what's the return of, invest, of investment, well, is, has that changed? I mean, like, the market is broadened so immensely, and like I said before, I think it's, it's increased so much over the past 15 or 20 years, so a lot of different people from different regions have gotten involved for all different reasons. So there are old school collectors that have been involved for generations and generations, but again, contemporary art has excelled to such a rapid degree at the, I mean, if you look at the old master market, I could see it ultimately being extinct in a matter of years. There's such a kind of, uh, it, it's sad, but uh, there's less scholarship involved. It's, it's less of, this. all of the gravity is in post-war and contemporary art. And in a way, when, contem when contemporary art is, 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 is valued in excess of modern art, there are, there's always gonna be issues. And again, like I, it all reverts back to what your intent is, what's your dedication, and what's your, what's your knowledge about a given subject. So I think that, I mean, there's a load of talk about art as an asset class. Art, it still will take me two years to sell a Picasso. I mean, it's a very difficult thing. It's a very illiquid market art. But nevertheless, I believe in the inherent value of art, and I, st I various people, you can't get in and get out. All of these people that come in and think they're gonna make a quick profit trading Christian Roses, well, they, they, I'm sure they learned their lesson and, and went and hightailed out of the market. Either you fall in love with it and it's a passion game. The only way to, to I believe that you can invest successfully even today in contemporary art, but it has to come from a place of knowledge and passion. Uh-oh. I don't like the uh, look in your no, eyes. I, but, but wouldn't you have said that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 I've years ago? I've been saying it since I started. I mean, I just don't think that it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a short haul game on any level. Okay, let's flip it around a little bit. There were, what would you give as advice to artists who are seeing this happen and they see, you know, they have one chance at a week. You can be involved with hundreds of artists and dozens of galleries. If you're an artist, you have one go. What advice would you give them? Are, are we in a post whatever, post zombie formalism, bubble speculative moment that we're in, or neo post zombie formalist market? What What would you tell an artist who's? Excuse me. You, you want to translate tried. that into English? I think that I mean again, nothing is absolutely nothing has changed. I mean, I've worked with emerging artists for decades and showing the work of non-represented artists in my curatorial efforts. It's I mean, there are more ways for an artist today to communicate their work to a wider audience with means like you mentioned Instagram. Instagram was never created as a platform <clears throat> for fine art. It's the default. I mean, really there's been incredibly, I think it's um, like there's no quick transport on an airplane today to get from here to Europe, and uh, 
there's no quick, no internet site that intended to, to break into the art sector has ever really succeeded. I mean, there's Artnet for price transparency. There's a whole slew of these new um, auction platforms like Paddle 8 and Artsy. But I just, Instagram is really, I think it's been the paradigm shift in my lifetime in relationship to art, and it was never intended as such, but it's, if you're an artist, the most important thing is to, to communicate your work and have your work seen. I mean, artists thinking about the market and flip, it's a dangerous scenario if an artist is thinking about who they're gonna sell into and how many series they could make uh, to crack a market. Should they be interested in how their art does at auction? I mean, you have to be cognizant about all of, of course they should. I mean, artists have to be more than ever with everything that we're speaking about. An artist needs to take responsibility on every level of their career more than ever. And there are more ways to do so, but I think that, you know, they have to be very proactively involved or they're gonna get screwed. And I, I, you think that all this sense of the digital error is over, but I was recently, yesterday, some journalists in Singapore asked me if the online art platform would replace art galleries. And I was kind of shocked that that could even be a thought. I mean, it's some, I never, I only recently had got an iPhone, so I was never on Instagram until about six months ago. And I was shocked to see that you can't even expand the images on Instagram, which is the most ludicrous thought because, so when you're looking at these tiny little images on a tiny little screen, it's hardly a substitute for the visceral process of standing in front of a painting. I mean, I would say we're all here in this room today because we love art and we love the experience of it. And for me, whether it's a drawing or a painting or a sculpture, it's like reading a book and I press my nose against an art piece in my house every day of my life and it enriches my life and it, 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 it adds a great deal of depth to my um, to everyday experiences and nothing, especially on a teeny little stupid screen, normally a lot of them are cracked, a lot of them are, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's a good way to convey information to follow through with something. And sure, if you're a seasoned dealer and a professional, we've all bought and sold art uh, from a JPEG, but nothing replaces walking up and down these aisles and, and, and seeing the thing itself and nothing ever will replace it. Otherwise, it's not art, it's a reflection of art. But it's, it's tough to argue against you, Kenny, when I agree with you all the time, so it's a little bit annoying. I was hoping you would play a little different role there, a, a little bit, but... Um, it's a bit kinky, all this role play stuff that you're into. We'll, we'll discuss. <laughs> That's why your fee was doubled, but... Um, maybe this is a good point, that there might be some questions just about the art market in general, or from the vantage point of an artist or uh, curator. So does anybody want to... That way we can sort of segue into areas that some of you might have interest. So if somebody has a question, raise your hand. And when the mic comes to you, identify yourself as much as you'd like to. Hi, my name is Randy Scott. I'm an advisor. Um, uh, Ken, I'd want to ask you, if there's an artist um, that you don't know necessarily, and I'm sure you know most of them, but for those of us who might not, what, three, what are your three go-tos to get information? on the artist if you need to get something quickly, like scholarly stuff or paper or papers or well, I mean, editors, for, blogs? For, for young artists that are getting started, there, there, are very, there are variables that constitute how a young artist is valued. And the dealers, they, I mean, for an artist who's having their first shows, the dealer that they're working with is almost as important or more important than that work that they're actually making. So the important ingredients for an emerging artist are where are they showing, who's buying the work, who's selling the work, and who's writing about the work. And, it's just, and, then, and these are the kind of the critical response, institutional support. Rather more so a review of the artist or a biographical, uh, you know, those are, those are given and I understand that. I meant more, you know, is there, do you prefer to read Roberta Smith? Do you, you know, as far as actual reviews of the artist, or even some of us who may not, let's say, somebody wants to go into Grosjean, and they want to learn quickly about Grosjean, and there's a lot uh, written on the web, and he's a dense artist. I mean, if you're talking about an artist of that caliber, I would go right to Artnet. So, I mean, the first place you go is, does an artist have a track record in the auction world, and then you look at the, the pricing history. So, first, I would go, Artnet has been, an ex I mean, it, it, it's not been an enormous business in terms of, 
I mean, we're back to the financial side of it, but Artnet has been the biggest change in my life where it's introduced pricing transparency and comparable prices into the market. So I think it's been an extraordinary thing. And I would look at Artnet and then look in the newspapers to see what kind of critical response and see if there's any notion of who's buying and selling the work and who's exhibiting it. If I can answer it a little bit, but what's confusing now is people have learned how to be very vertical in their thinking and their knowledge. And they, on Mark Brojan, they could tell you everything from the early work that's 2000 and whatever till now. And they're used to thinking this way. And it's very difficult to learn to think horizontally at the same time. Grosjean, what's going on with the history of abstraction? How is his abstract art different? How does it relate to the history of abstract art? And clients, many of whom are in financial things, are really good at drilling all the way down and gathering information. That's how they do it. But the, the real test is to try to, I think, how to think sideways at the same time. How does this relate to other people? And that's sort of how I would try to learn that way. Next question, please. Hi. I uh, just bought two paintings in London of an artist I was following for many years. And oddly, the dealer made me sign a, a contract that I would not flip the, the paintings, which I had no intention of doing. But this is, is this a new kind of system? And how can you even legislate that internationally? That's a, good, that's a great question. It's funny because this phenomenon of signing, when you buy a piece of certain uh, desirable emerging artists, the galleries will often make you sign, uh, sign an invoice that says you give them a right of first refusal to buy the painting back before you offer it anywhere else and that you'll never auction it. And I'm a lapsed lawyer, as was, as was mentioned before. Believe, this contract was first introduced in the 90s and I'm pretty certain that it was Andrea Rosen, the gallery, that first introduced this contract. And I remember her having, uh, insisting I sign one of these agreements. And after 10 years of happily fleeing the legal profession, I put myself back in, in front of a computer and I did the research and I, I wrote a paper called like the unenforceable Andrea Rosen contract. So these contracts, basically, you can't have a contract that has an infinite uh, term to it, and there's no remuneration. They're not paying you any, th there's no quid pro quo. When you sign a contract, they're, the galleries are asking you to give something away without giving you something in return. So I would say that these contracts are entirely unenforceable, and they're against the kind of laissez-faire economics, and they're a, a restriction in trade. And I, I don't believe in the inherent, in, I, I think they're unenforceable, and they're just simply not right. I mean, what's gonna happen when you buy a piece of young art and you turn around and sell it, you lose your relationship with the dealer and that's the end of the story. But these contracts, I think maybe once back in the 90s, uh, actually Andrea Rosen was successful in getting a John Curran painting pulled from Phillips auction. But to, the auction houses are so utterly competitive and so mercenary, they will sell. I mean, I've had artists claim that pieces are not art that it was a gift or famously, Robert, there was a Robert Gober sculpture of a dollhouse and there was a sign on the wall at Christie's and said, the artist disclaims this piece as a work of art. It was done as a work of carpentry for hire and the bidet was removed and the wallpaper was changed in the bathroom in this dollhouse. But really the intent of the, the art is the art and the, in a sense, it's true that the intent of the artist has nothing to do with it. It's the thing speaks for itself and these contracts are just, I understand, again, if you're buying a piece of art from an artist and an artist is getting started, the artist doesn't want to see their work flip into auction where they lose control of the pricing. If it goes up, then, I mean, the artist, there's so many complications that happen when premature art goes into auction, and I'm very much against it, personally. I think that it brings a lot of negative implications for, it, it, it causes, you know, it could, it, it, it's a distraction, a, dis a disturbance in the, in the organic, slow pricing, rational pricing of an artist. I mean, there's a normal ethical procedure when you come to resell something, which is generally go back to where you bought it from the first place and give them an opportunity. So to be asked to do this and to be placed ahead of 20 other people who might have wanted the same thing, I can understand that desire to sort of have this, what I agree with Kenny's unenforceable, but there's also could be a little bit of a moral thing of they put me ahead of 20 other people for me to get that, that I'll play along with this and at least give an opportunity. Why did they put you ahead of 20 other people? Because you signed the paper. 
okay? Because you said, I'll play by your rules, that if it goes up, I'll always give you that opportunity. Um, what I will say is, if that artist is out of favor 10 years from now, they'll be happy to sell art to the Ayatollah Khomeini. If they walk in and say, you know, can, you, can I use my ISIS Bitcoin account to pay for it and no one else wants it, they'll probably say, how do I invoice you? So, I mean, it works both ways um, there. We had a question in the back, I think. Uh, my name's Peter from, uh, I'm in finance. Um, I'm just wondering, art at its highest level, um, where you're selling things for $100 million or, or, or up to the tens of millions, is that all about just capitalism or is it about the love of art? So the people buying them, what are they buying it for? I mean, the, you, you just can't pigeonhole something which is such a broad question. The in, there are sovereign countries that are buying art to put into museums. There are, you hear so much about people laundering money or buying ca social cachet. There's a thousand different reasons. I mean, for some people, it's like nailing a bag of money to the wall so all your friends know that that's the $100 million Picasso hanging in your house. And some people have the... the the, act, the love of that particular painting. I mean, there's the Named Gallery in the fair. They have 200 Picasso paintings, and you could be sure that they know the market, they appreciate the finance involved, but they know a hell of a lot about Fontanas and Calders and Picassos in this work. So, I mean, some, you just can't, it's, it's too big a question. You know, there are just too many people buying it for too many different reasons to narrow it down. I mean, I'll make two general comments since that anybody buying work of art for over $100 million at the moment is generally not making an investment or a good investment because all the investment value has already been sucked out of it. So it's not a very good investment. Um, it is a store of wealth. And the only exception to that is because of tax laws that allow you to defer paying capital gains, people can be doing it as a swap for different art that's appreciated in value, where they love this one more than that one, and they can sort of trade into it. George? We can't hear you, so we need a mic microphone. Being an art. The question was, how did Kenny go from being a lawyer, and apparently he still was a member of the bar, to being an art world person? How much time do you have? And I'll tell you the whole story. But I mean, I always wanted, I was, I grew up in the suburbs in Long Island, and I was not even cognizant that art was bought and sold in a, in a commercial context, believe it or not. I was so isolated. And then I just thought that art simply went from the artist into a museum. And when Warhol died, I was procrastinating from an exam and went to see uh, the auction of his stuff at Sotheby's. And I thought it was his art alone, but it was his vast collection that he had accumulated over the course of his life by trading. And anyway, and then Sotheby's was gearing up for a contemporary art sale in the fall, whenever the next season was. And it was a revelation for me to see that art was actually bought and sold. So personally, I was looking for something that was creative and entrepreneurial at the same time, and I was never aware. Once I, hit, once I found out that this is actually something that, that is a career, which I, I honestly had no idea about, I just started, like when I talk about people loving art and being passionate about it, I've been doing, I curated dozens and dozens of shows with emerging artists over the course of these 25 years, and I exhibited the work of people like Wade Guyton, who's another one of these young artists who's selling for enormous amounts of money now. Joe Bradley, I gave his first show in 2003, and a host of other artists. But it was just by, literally, I would trade things to take spaces over. It was just sheer grit and determination that I wanted to carve out a role for myself in this wonderful place called the art world. And with all of the politics and the upsides and the downsides and the good people and the bad people, there's no place I'd rather be. And I consider myself very lucky to be involved. And one of my kids is here who's painting and getting at Parsons now. And it's a joy that we have this shared language and means of communication, which if it wasn't for that, we probably have nothing to ever say to each other. But literally, I just would trade paintings that I had accumulated when I was lawyering, and I traded for spaces, and I sat in the gallery for 10 hours. I could never, the art, the art gallery system, most of what I do is a reaction, in a sense, 
a critique of the entire commercial dissemination system. I was, I mean, I never, art, the art gallery and the art world works unlike any other business in the world. Where you talk about these waiting lists, for instance, of art, there's no such thing as a waiting list. The waiting list is who hierarchically is more important, and that's the list. So let's try to get a few more questions in, Georgina. <laughs> she asked, and I answered. <laughs> well, you could go on for um, months. Georgina, a journalist. Um, there's been so much talk about asset as art as an asset class. Do you think that what happened to zombie formalism and this collapse of zombie formalism and that speculative aspect, has that had an effect on the notion of art as an asset class, or is that just a blip? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't agree. I mean, in, as a strict asset class, it's not art. I agree with Josh said that it's a store of wealth, like gold. In a way, if you look at kind of all of the glitter has been gone from the gold market recently, and on a certain level, I believe that literally art has surpassed gold. And in a sense, it's like a zero-sum game where art has now taken the place of gold as a store of wealth. So as the market in art goes higher and higher, it's almost as though it's for fewer and fewer things by fewer and fewer people being sold by fewer people. Obvious art by obvious artists is a store of wealth. If you look at a graph of Picasso since his work started to sell, it's a very happy line that goes up and will always go up. Since art came off the wall of a cave, it's been coveted by people. And as long as we exist as a culture and humanity and all of these dark forces that are unfortunately uh, taking over so many parts of our lives these days, that's really the only thing in my estimation that could ever get in the way of art. Is art a an asset class like a share or a bond or these no is it a store of wealth and is it a, a viable and uh, and but legitimate did, place to put your money absolutely but all to of disagree my money with you i'm going to say because i have these conversations in general is that you can't think of art as just of an asset class without saying that people are diversifying within that asset class so people who are mega collectors buying 50 100 million art paintings are also thinking about playing at the 10, 20, $100,000 level. So they're diversifying with the idea that some goes up, some goes down, some they win, some they lose. So it's even with that demise of one part of it, whether it's Chinese contemporary, whatever, there's a sense of a balanced or diversified portfolio for most people. We have a question in the back. Uh, following on that same line of questioning, um, so there, what would be your recommendation on art funds to be able to channel uh, the um, art as an investment class? Recently, uh, art did surpass gold and, uh, in the amount traded on a yearly basis, and it has no allocation to private banks. And currently, there's uh, some new art funds coming out in the U.S. that are um, uh, SEC under SEC supervised type funds, which is very good. But what would be your thoughts? I mean, again, the, the joy of art is the art. And when you divorce the art from the aesthetics, I think it's very problematic. Because if you're gonna treat it as simply, I mean, I'd rather be invested in a, in, a, in a fund, a stock fund, if that's my sole intention. I think if you're not gonna be involved in learning about the art and, and of your, I just, as I said, if you divorce the art from the, from the asset, there's a problem, an inherent problem. And there's never been a single art fund to date that's done it well and done it successfully. There was Philip Hoffman's art fund, which was the most noted. But if you look at what they're doing, they're doing more um, advisorial roles now and advising whether it's collectors or sovereigns and doing research. I, don't, I, I believe that there's in something inherently wrong with the notion of an art fund, personally. Do we have another question? I have a question about um, the market anointed branded artists versus the art historically important artists. For example, Sam Gilliam, major African American artist who's in his 80s, only now is starting to get some market appreciation versus, say, like a Michael Boriamans, wonderful painter, Zwarner branded, whose market exceeds his by almost a thousand percent. I just want to know your thoughts on market anointed versus art historically important. Well, well, Sam McGilliam's a good example. You know, now that big galleries are putting a big push, people who could have bought a Sam Gilliam every day for the last 50 years and didn't suddenly want them. I mean, that troubles me. It's like suddenly, you know, and it means that when the price of something goes up, the demand goes up. 
conversely, when the price of something goes down, the demand goes down. It's a very bizarre thing, and it, it on an artist that's been well known historically for 40 or 50 years to suddenly become the hottest commodity clearly means that people buying them didn't like them well enough to be the first or only one buying one that year. So by the time it's made that jump, you've missed the speculative moment because it's already gone up a factor of five by that. So it makes me skittish. I mean, I just, the market is a fickle beast. And whether you see, if you see the quality in something that the mark, I mean, you can't will a market. So the market, like Josh said, it affirms strength and successes. So it's funny because if something is a masterpiece at 5,000, it's easier to sell like Damien Hirst's 1,928th spot painting than it is to sell the work of an unknown artist that you may consider masterful for $5,000. When something is 5,000, most people at the higher of this more speculative side, no one's interested. When it's 50,000, people start to talk. And then when it's a few hundred thousand, everybody wants to jump in the game. Again, those are kind of human characteristics that drive people's motivations. But I know people that say, I'm buying this particular artist because he did this or she did this before everyone else. And this work is extraordinary and it should be embraced. Should, would, could. But again, the market is a beast and it, it's a multi-headed beast and it, it works in its own way. So there are all these various things that c contribute to making a market like we've been discussing, but one person or just seeing the, the value of a piece is not gonna be enough. There's, there's a whole host of different things and a lot of them could be seemingly arbitrary or unfair or unjust in some respect, but that's just the market. Well, most people are actually momentum buyers and they're following the curve and they say they don't want to follow the curve and they don't want to be sheep. Most people are. And it takes real courage to buy off the curve and which should be rewarded because I think buying art is an act of faith in and of itself. So, and if your judgment and view of history is better, you'll probably um, be rewarded. And if not, you're buying something you love, like Kenny said. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, Jeffrey, uh, collector, dealer, oh, been around a while. The, uh, we've seen the auction houses sort of broaden their reach the last 10 years, uh, private sales, theme sales. But when I come to a show like this, I'm always struck not by just the good work, but by the good dealers that I know. And I wanted to, I wonder if you'd just talk to that when you're talking about people who can source through uh, and, and sift through all this kind of... Uh, chatter the primacy of a really good art dealer and why they're valuable still i mean i think art having an art gallery it's a hapless job and there's so much criticism there are certain dealers selling emerging art one in particular comes to mind who's been uh blasting the galleries and critiquing the galleries nonstop. and really it like i said it's a it's it's an extraordinarily difficult job to be a dealer and Someone like Sadie Coles, for instance, from London is doing maybe seven or eight fairs a year. It's an extraordinary amount of work. It's an extraordinary amount of personal and familial sacrifice where she has to travel all over the globe all the time, leave her kids, leave her family. And dealers nurture, I mean, dealers perform an extraordinary job, galleries, in terms of nurturing their careers of the artists, archiving all of their output. and. You know, if you're showing an artist and you're representing 10 artists, you may not agree with every one person show of one of your artists, but you have to have this unflagging support and continue. And again, like, and then artists jump ship like free agents and they can leave the dealer. The dealer can do a whole load of work and then the dealer, the, the artist can jump ship and go to a, so it's, I think that galleries, I mean, thankfully I don't have one. I've had one in the past and I much prefer to work independently because the overhead is much dramatically reduced and it gives me the freedom and the independence. But gal galleries and here in, in these fairs, it's an extraordinarily difficult task that they have. As someone who had a gallery for 10 years and doesn't miss it either for all the same reasons, what's important to recognize, and this addresses, I think the gentleman left his question, that the role of the 
critic that Clement Greenberg, people have been in my talks before I've heard this, the role of Clement Greenberg is no longer played by Roberta Smith or Peter Schaldahl. The, the role of Clement Greenberg or Howard Rosenberg is played by Marion Goodman or Barbara Gladstone, is played by the gallers saying, these are the anointed artists that I've done the homework of, and they're the brand, and they're not doing it out of uh, commercialism, out of belief that that's, that's the critical mass is that those 10, 20, whatever ones you favor, taking up an artist. Well, I mean, in a way, I think the collectors today have become the new critics, not the dealers. I think this whole, the, the rash of private museums, I mean, Miami. They've become the curators. Miami, no, I think that private museums are like this imprimatur. Even if you look at, like the Rubel's show, they're making markets. The private museums today are like uh, multi-family offices or private banks like the Safra Bank or the Rothschild family. If you look at even like Damien Hirst opens a museum showing the work of a, of a largely, completely unknown British modern abstract painter, John Hoyland, Damien owns 60 of the paintings. So in a way, these private museums, they affirm value of the very artist. Damien buys and sells art at Sotheby's all the time, not just his own, and he has a very gigantic collection. But if you look at, if you have a museum like that, so art does not give you revenue, it doesn't, it, the dividends are visual, but if you are a proactive collector, and there's so many, I wonder, a lot of these private museums are taking away the art, I'm sorry if anyone here has one, but a lot of art that would go to, to public institutions will not go to public institutions because of these tax avoidance schemes known as, and these private museums, I'm not, again, this is a blanket comment, but someone like Damien has 60 Hoylands, he puts 30 into a show. I knew people that were front running, buying Hoylands because they knew before it was announced that Damien Hurst was showing this unknown artist who was sure to pick up in value subsequent to him showing it. So in a way, there are all of these kind of shenanigans that could be put into effect by people to manipulate values or change. It, like you said, it used to be the critics. It used to be, but now it's a totally different world. And there's, you know, there's really a small handful of dealers that, that have the power today. And again, it's like, it's a shame in a sense that it's obvious things selling by obvious people through obvious dealers and obvious auction houses. And, but again, like there are always new galleries popping up, there are always, there's always emerging art being made, and you can't just, even what I just said, there's still young galleries doing great things, and old galleries doing great things, but there's been a certain shift at the higher end, which is a little worrisome, I think. And on that, um, we'd like to thank you for coming out on a set rain that's going there, and thank you for coming. Eventually, this will be online. Thank you, Kenny.